to turn to you, Daniel and Helen, um, for our next presentation. Um, these are colleagues from um, Kindling who's going to be talking to us about the state of fire safety in humanitarian settings. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand, I can see you well. Um, if you need support to share your screen or anything, please let me know. Otherwise, over to you. Thank you, Juan. Um, we'll try to get the screen share going as we start talking. Um, thank you so much. We're we're really happy to be able to share together. Um, Helen and I are both in Cape Town at the moment for a project on fire safety and informal settlements. Um, so we have the luxury of sitting next to each other as we're presenting today. Um, so today we're going to be reflecting on uh, a recent project that is, is in the process of coming to the end for publication. Um, this is a project that is sponsored um, by the Global Shelter Cluster for Construction Standards Working Group um, and generously supported by UK Aid and USAID uh, BHA. Um, so this project is really looking at the current state of fire safety and humanitarian shelter and settlements. Um, as a brief introduction, Kindling as an organization um, is a US-based NGO. Um, I'm the founder and executive director. Helen is our head of educational research and delivery. Um, and Kindling is all about making fire safety accessible for all, um, including a lot of focus on fire safety in the humanitarian sector. Um, over the years of Kindling, but also before Kindling, when we both have engaged in previous roles, um, we've been really looking at how fire risk emerges and what the kind of um, solutions are that can be developed in the humanitarian sector. But over the years, through several engagements um, with CCCM practitioners, shelter practitioners, and many others, um, we found that there really hasn't been a unified understanding of where the current state of the field is around fire. What are the current uh, risk factors? How does risk come about? What are the consequences to people, to humanitarian action, and going on from there? Um, so this project is a really exciting opportunity where we are able to um, pause and engage in many different ways, which Helen will describe, and actually look at the current state of the field. Um, it's not out for publication yet, um, but we're going through uh, the final process of the report publication now, so it will be ready soon. We're going to share some of the key insights that we've learned. Um, and also talk about a guidance document that's under development. So I'll hand over to Helen. Um, and I will say Helen's also planning to be in Geneva for the CCCM annual meeting. So I'd like this to be maybe a formal introduction of Helen to the CCCM cluster um, that I've been fortunate to engage with in the past as well. So thank you and over to you, Helen. Hey, uh, hi everybody. Um, and thanks for giving us the time today to talk um, about this um, important piece of work that we've been working on for around 18 months. Um, so uh, I'm hoping, um, so I'm not gonna um, go into huge amounts of detail because I'm already aware that we are over time. I'm not gonna put sound on here, but as we um, are talking, Danielle and I- Flames and panic, um, the largest refugee camp in the world. More than a million refugees. I'll read it, there you go. Um, I'm hoping that um, you there's not too much noise behind us, but we're actually in Cape Town at the moment, um, and we're we've been talking with communities, talking with uh, many different actors as part of a, a project that we're looking at. Um, and one of the things that comes up, and you can see uh, the reason the this video is on now, is that the effects of fire. We all know that um, it has huge amounts of um, impacts, many different ways. But one of the things that communities are telling us now is that something that's missing from um, any kind of response is actually the recognition of the trauma um, that, that happens. Um, so when we are engaging with communities here, we're trying to um, make sure that we're, we're not thinking just about the uh, more physical needs, but that the conversation also moves on to thinking about the uh, emotional, social health and the more complex needs as well that, that emerge. Uh, both within a disaster, but as many of our respondents said to us, that fire is a disaster within a disaster. So it has um, an additional impact on uh, the people involved. Um, so um, fire, as many of you know, um, it's a huge problem. Um, it frequently harms displaced people, undermines humanitarian assistance, um, 
but many of the times they don't make international headlines. And in fact, one of our respondents once said um, that they won't get counted unless more than four shelters are destroyed. Um, the, the fact that there are some uh, really well-known fires um, is, is kind of grabbing attention, but the, the people that we're speaking to and so many people who on this call, you will know that people live with an experienced fire risk every day. Um, ultimately, Kindling is approaching um, fire safety as a matter of protection, and we're also investigating through this work um, systems around accountability to affected populations as well. Um, now, one of the important things is that hum um, humanitarian um, settings are are deeply affected and not just the actual shelters themselves but again as we know people on this call will know that it's actually the supporting facilities can also be affected so we have to think not just about the um uh, the kind of the very visible effects but also the the times when people um when the services and the buildings that support humanitarian um, assistance are also affected by fire there's no global st statistic at the moment about fires in humanitarian settings and it's one of the key findings that we'll talk about later so it does make it really difficult to demonstrate how significant the problem is how did we go about trying to understand this problem then? Well, we came at this from um, the goal of wanting to, um, sorry, uh, Namia uh, has got your hand raised. I don't know, uh, is the work, are you able to see my screen? Is it moving? It's working fine, Helen. We can also take questions at the end as All well. Right. Okay, we'll you... take questions at the end, thank you. Um, so the, uh, when we were thinking about um, institutionalizing fire safety across the humanitarian sector, um, we needed to come from the starting point of what is the current state of it? What is currently known? What is currently done? Um, what is the state of the field? And we came up with one main research question and three objectives. So we were focusing on the different knowledges around fire safety practices, specifically within shelter and settlement programming. Um, and this this project was funded by the Global Shelter Cluster. We should make that really um, make, make that really clear. Um, three objectives to be able to describe how fire risk emerges, um, particularly within humanitarian settings, to explore how fire safety knowledge uh, and expertise connects to the humanitarian practices at local and global levels, and then to talk about implicit and explicit lines of responsibility as well. Um, how did we do it? Very, very quickly. Uh, a literature review. We did 29 semi-structured interviews. We had focus groups that were both technical and socio-technical with humanitarian practitioners and fire, sci fire scientists, fire engineers, um, fire safety specialists, fire uh, responders. Um, and we had a desktop analysis as well. We followed the respect code of ethics but we should acknowledge, especially given that we're talking to uh, the CCM um, today, is that more participants came from the shelter, um, uh, from people who work within shelter sector or clusters, um, and from people who are already engaged with the issue of fire. So we know that there is um, that kind of leaning within the work. Um, we also need to acknowledge that there was limited data, which for us is a finding itself, but it does mean that we... Um, are kind of having to work within that context. In terms of the outcome, so we have quite a long report and we hope that um, it'll be um, published soon, that you'll be able to uh, go and read it and that you'll find um, in there, there's a really comprehensive review of the technical analysis. So we're framing that as the engineering perspective. We then um, follow that up with the humanitarian perspective. So we um, cover all three of those um, objectives. Um, and we bring the social and the technical together. And this is something that's um, really quite unique about the work and about the research team, that we actually have a team that is uh, balanced in terms of the technical specialists and the social um, scientists as well. Um, and then there's discussion, conclusion, and some recommendations. We also um, have produced what we are very clearly labeling as version one of the guidance, uh, because there are things in there that we still um, want to develop. We want, uh, we believe that there needs to be more information and more knowledge um, created. And I'll speak a little bit more to that later. Um, but there's nine sections. You can see some of the topics there. Um, and the aim is for it to uh, be received um, as something that is practical that people can, can do. But as we say, 
there are more topics we would want to include and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, so just to give you a little bit of um, a, a flavour of what's in the report then, um, describing how fire risk emerges in humanitarian shelter and settlements. I'm going to um, bring Danielle in as our technical, uh, as our engineer, just to give a very brief um, insight into the engineering perspective. Thank you, Helen. Um, so this is just a diagram that we wanted to share quickly. It's actually from research done at Stellenbosch University. Um, and it's a nice, easy illustration to talk about different mechanisms of fire spread. Um, I'm not going to try in one conversation or one quick presentation to explain everything from an engineering perspective, and hopefully our report will be an aid to support that. But maybe one key uh, lesson for the day um, from an engineering perspective is what are, you know, to walk away understanding the three kind of main mechanisms of fire spread that we see in informal settlements and humanitarian settlements generally. Now, this image is based off of enclosures in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, there are different types of fire, um, the fire behavior that we see, but generally we see that fire can spread either through radiation, just shown on the right. Um, so that's actually through electromagnetic waves where heat transfers over basically over air and space. Um, then we have the issue of flame impingement. Um, so that's on the left of the screen. You can see that if you have an enclosure that um, stays intact, then the openings often become um, an area where you'll have flames ex extending outside and that can become um, a source of ignition to neighboring dwellings. And then thirdly, something to mention is branding or spotting. Um, so these are um, often associated with wildfires, but we do see them in humanitarian settlement fires as well. So that's when vegetation or construction materials, for example, um, that are burning become um, separated from their main, um, main piece of material, and then they actually travel in the air and are deposited onto another area. Now that's really important to think about from the perspective of a combustible roof, for example. If you had thatched roof, which we've seen in um, Northern Thailand, for example, um, we have the thatch itself is easy, easily becomes brands because the thatch, um, when it catches fire, it can then um, separate from the roof and travel through the wind um, and then landing on another roof of, of thatch, which is highly um, combustible and very easy to ignite. So that's how you can get fires that um, might seem like they were started in many different locations, but actually you have fire spreading um, through the, the wind. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. We can get to turn. Um, another thing that we are acknowledging in the report and really trying to explore, not only in this research, but in further research that Kindling is now undertaking, is trying to understand how um, fire risk emerges in different typologies of settlements. Now, the two primary categories, if we refer to the camp management minimum standards, are the outside camp um, settings and the camp and camp-like settings. Um, when we talk about outside camp, we really are referring often to the built environment that often is formal or it could be informal. Um, but we tend to be looking back to kind of existing regulatory system, the quality of housing stock, um, and looking at it from a more traditional fire engineering perspective, um, with the exception of um, some things that fall outside the regulatory environment or when a regulatory environment is no longer intact. Um, then when we go to camp and camp-like settings, this is um, kind of the more common area of discussion when we talk about fire in humanitarian settings. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single typology here, but I want to mention that um, a lot of attention further goes into planned camps and informal settlements for good reason. Um, because the risk of fire spread in particular is quite significant and the large population can be exposed to the dangers of fire and the losses from fire. Um, but we also need to really think about fire in collective centers, evacuation centers, reception centers, for example, um, where we might have buildings that are not intended to have people sleeping in them and we are using them now as accommodation. Um, and that can significantly change the risk profile. And often we don't have buildings or infrastructure that's being used for the purpose that it was designed. Now, what um, we need to go further into thinking about typologies, and I'm using typologies in a very uh, wide lens here. We could get into a discussion around nuances, but um, essentially we, we need to think about, you know, what is this 
what is this being um, used for, whether it's a building that was a school now being used for shelter or, or um, a kind of different type of infrastructure in Ukraine. We've seen that there's railways. So, um, that's one thing to consider from the previous types of um, kind of camp and camp like settings. But now when we're talking about typologies here, we really are referring to kind of shelters at the shelter scale. So at the shelter scale, we actually see quite different behavior occurring. If any of you were on the call earlier when Paul Chamberlain was sharing from MOAS, I'm sure he was sharing about the behavior of the kind of plastic sheeting bamboo structures that we see in Cox's Bazaar. Those behave quite differently from the structures we see in Cape Town where we are at the moment, um, which look more like the picture on the top left of the screen. Um, I don't have time to get into this now, and it's actually an area of further exploration, but it is an important factor to consider when we're considering how fire risk emerges. And like Helen said earlier, thinking about the other higher risk buildings, such as healthcare centers, warehouses, et cetera. So um, we're certainly trying to bring more fire engineering and just um, kind of design principles to bear um, and mixing it with the socio-technical complexities that Helen's speaking to. Yeah, and just to bring it back to the um, the socio-technical and what that means for people uh, on this call with, and working within the CCM and indeed in the um, shelter and settlements, um, people often said to us that they want guidance that tells them about all of these different types of shelters and what they need to do in relation to all of the, the different types of shelters. And we really wish that we were able to produce um, guidance, but we are not there yet. Um, and when I say we, um, or we mean all of the fire um, engineers, the fire safety um, practitioners, uh, responders, the knowledge about how these different shelters um, interact with human beings and vice versa, um, and how fire interacts in that space, it's just not there. We don't have the technical knowledge or enough socio-technical understanding of fire in these different uh, settlement, uh, shelter and settlement types to produce comprehensive um, and conclusive guidance for each uh, type of shelter yet. Um, we, as a research team, we really wrestled with what we should do about that. And we intentionally decided that to offer um, inaccurate or incomplete information based on the current assumptions could actually lead to unintended consequences that we as a team are trying to prevent. So in the guidance, we know people wanted um, a guide for what should I do if the shelter looks like this? What should I do if the shelter looks like that? We aren't there yet, um, but we hope that you will find the technical information within the fire engineering and much of the content will help lead you to that. But it's something that we're working on and Kindling has um uh, um, a project that's developing that work. Yeah, and when we get to the end of the presentation, talk about guidance, I can share a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I wanted to, to go into a little bit about the, the humanitarian perspective. So as I said, we did 29 interviews and we had focus groups as well. Um, and there isn't enough time to go through all of uh, everything that we found, but um, just to kind of give you an overview, um, in the humanitarian, when we had our conversations from people working within or supporting um, the humanitarian sector at its broadest um, and within the different clusters, um, people were really uh, able to talk about ignition risks. They were able to talk about um, cooking as being um, a really significant risk. Um, people did talk about the daily activities, about heating, lighting, and the way people um, go about their daily lives. Energy is a particularly um, uh, relevant factor. Um, we're also, we've got some talk about uh, the impact of burns and injury, um, but we we were expecting a little bit more of that. And if in future work, we would want to engage with public health teams in order to, to make connections there as well. Um, when it came to the risk of fire spread and limited space planning and resources, you can see from these images here um, that it was quite obvious that people within the sector, um, they know that settlement de uh, settlement density is identified as being the most prominent driver behind fire spread. Um, this is supported by, um, albeit limited, academic literature as well. Um, fire breaks, uh, incredibly important, um, but rare. Um, access is often limited to um, fire services. Um, and even if there is access, is there 
um, the actual capacity to um, do anything uh, about fire as well. Um, another uh, aspect that we need to investigate more is around storage um, and fuels and other combustible materials um, within individual shelters. Um, in most cases, the space available for humanitarian response is limited, uh, whether that's for physical, political, social reasons. So there's a really critical issue. Um, and this means that uh, increasing the uh, number of shelters per land um, isn't necessarily um, something that's possible. Um, so we need to work within and we need to understand a bit more about what that means when there is limited space. Um, in terms of the, sorry, um, in terms of um, policy and guidance, um, there were some really interesting um, comments and reflections. The available guidance um, that specifically or, and guidelines that talk specifically about fire is very limited. Um, different agencies and organizations produce different internal documentation to raise the issue among staff, um, but it's impossible um, at this stage to um, be able to cater for every different type of shelter um, and all the different types of um, humanitarian settings uh, because risk emerges in different ways for different people in different shelter types. Um, so it's no surprise that at, with the current state of the, the knowledge and data um, that no one approach covers all the necessary aspect, but we would argue that there is no one silver bullet anyway. Uh, there are things that can be done, um, but there is no one um, this side, th this one solution will fit everybody um, or for every setting. Um, we also can't generalize the different vulnerabilities as well. Um, there are different people, uh, people are exposed to fire hazards in different ways. They draw on different capacities to respond to the risks um, from that exposure. So we need to understand how people are, are exposed and the factors that lead to their different vulnerabilities. Um, there are social factors, ethnicity, age, gender, social identity, um, perhaps the historical and, and social experience of fire, um, perhaps having been exposed to fire in a conflict situation may lead some people to delay evacuation. Um, a socio-political context that segregates via ethnicity or citizenship um, might mean that some people prioritize saving identity documents um, and therefore revisit a space um, that is on fire. So risk emerges in different ways for different people. Um, when we looked at um, uh, objective um, two, which was all about knowledge and practices, um, what we were there, what we were looking at here is um, the fire safety knowledge base within the humanitarian sector. So what do people know? What does the guidance say? Um, and a key message is that um, there is actually a, a real unevenness. Some people know a lot about one specific thing. Other people know a little about lots of uh, related issues. But the, the biggest um the biggest finding actually relates to community level knowledge um, that the most uh, the most important knowledge around being able to do something about making um, your uh, shelter, your home, um, your family, your household about making those um, making decisions to be safer. Um, people are very much lacking that knowledge about prevention. Um, people know how fires start, but they don't necessarily have the knowledge of the capacities um, and the actions that they can take to make themselves safer. Um, at a broader level, um, there are gaps in remaining uh, in relation to the, the data and incidents and, and evidence on the economic, environmental, social and health impacts of fire in, in humanitarian settings. Um, and we found that largely one of the things that humanitarians were saying to us is that there is no standardized reporting mechanism. So there's no standardized approach to logging fire incidents or, as one points out, the near misses. Um, so the scale of the problem isn't actually fully known. Senior staff within the sector, um, and we found a big finding is related to these what we call informal champions, um, they argue that there is significantly more fire incidents than the numbers currently suggest. 
So the knowledge about um, fire risks and safety are uneven across the sector, um, including the residents themselves um, who have to who appear to have the least consistent um, access to or understanding of how to prevent fires. Um, so our next concern was to find ways that knowledge and practice could actually be connected. And, and one of the things here is around the transient nature of a lot of humanitarian work. Um, we find people gain significant knowledge they, that, and significant contextual knowledge. They understand why fires are happening in a particular community. They start to, to look at um, ways where they can um, navigate that and reduce that. And then they often have to leave. Um, so handover processes, um, we could start looking at, at how um, fire incidents and knowledge around fire safety and what's been done before could start to um, transfer from one uh, person to the next. We also need to think about um, uh, reporting mechanisms for where people um, see fire incidents or understand that a fire incident um, has happened um, so that we can start to look at, at patterns as well. Um, and we need an understanding of uh, appro appropriate prevention, mitigation and preparedness activities. Um, there are a number of suggestions in the report about how we might close the knowledge gaps, um, but it, it goes beyond um, sensitization and information giving to actually start looking at um, different forms of education, communication and engagement activities. Um, where we can actually start to work with communities and look at the types of ways in which they create knowledge themselves, uh, the way that they're responding um, to, to fires and can start to create um, ideas around prevention that actually fits the way that they live as well. Um, so a final area was around um, implicit and explicit, uh, as well as actual and potential responsibilities. Um, so big, big um, issue here. Um, who is responsible? Well, implementation uh, responsibility. So this concerns the loss of life, injury, damage to shelter, um, effective use of um, funding. Um, we found that people were really keen to um, emphasize fire should be seen as an as a cross-cutting issue, that it needs to be mainstreamed in order to be able to start developing um, holistic responses. So thinking about um, a shared responsibility. Um, some were very, very clear to say that there is a funding gap, a massive funding gap um, where fire is concerned. And perhaps um, that exists because um, the there isn't enough data to actually say this is the financial impact. And so actually the, the kind of, there's not been for want of a better phrase, a cost benefit analysis. Um, the, uh, there is informality that exists within fire safety and response, um, and which means that you have two systems working alongside um, each other. Um, there are opportunities to build a community of practice. There are people, um, including within this call, who are really, really passionate, knowledgeable, um, and incredible champions for the uh, issue of fire safety in, in, uh, in humanitarian settings. Um, but this community of practice um, currently relies on these champions to try and work together. And um, there needs to be an opportunity for us to, to really build that. So uh, I know I'm I'm whistling through this. I'm trying to kind of uh, uh, get through a huge amount of um, content. There, here are 14 strategic recommendations. Um, we can go through some of these in in more depth at another um, at another time. Um, happy to answer any questions or engage with anybody on the call uh, in a conversation about this. And we hope that you'll uh, take some time to read the report, but. Um, you can see there, there are, there are some um, high level um, kind of comments here about the, that cover the more theoretical work from disaster risk reduction and how um, we make that happen to the education, knowledge, uh, knowledge funding. There's a lot going on there. Um, Danielle, did you want to come in quickly? Yeah, I suppose I just wanted to add something um, pointing to number 11 in particular and thinking about risk assessments. Um, I forgot to mention the typologies that we also need to consider the life cycle of humanitarian settlements. Um, I think we took a figure out of this drawing, but 
um, essentially thinking about how risk emerges over the lifetime and how it changes in a very dynamic nature and having tools, methods, policies, et cetera, to be able to deal with that changing nature of risk and making sure that as we have people coming in and out of the response that they have the tools to be able to make the best decisions at that moment in time, um, which is a good lead in um, is okay, yeah. to talk about the um, guidance. Um, so Helen already introduced this briefly and I'll give her a minute and a second to go back to it. As she said, this is very much the first edition. Um, it's not even ready yet to be published. It's with the funders and being reviewed. Um, what we are going to be recommending is that this is released as a, a provisional uh, document, but actually that we establish some sort of committee to come together with fire safety professionals and most importantly with humanitarian actors that have this experience to collectively um, develop this further. So we've tried to create a framework and starting point and hopefully some initial guidance that can get the ball rolling and help to inform action policy, etc. Um, but this can't be done in isolation by one agency. Um, and so we um, we have uh, potential further engagement on our side to be able to facilitate kindling and supporting this. Um, and we'll be looking for people to get involved. So um, it's kind of a, in a situation where stay tuned and let us know if you're interested and we'd love to engage with you on that. Um, fantastic. So um, we know that we've tried to, we've probably tried to over, um, uh, we wanted to get quite a lot of information across. Uh, I apologize if we were talking very quickly. Um, I guess this has to be a rhetorical question given the time we're on. Uh, what can CCM actors do to improve fire safety? We would argue there's a lot. Um, and um, we would really welcome you getting in touch with us. Um, there's both our contact details there if um, and there's a QR code for you to um, have a look at another one of the publications, an opinion piece. Um, please do get in touch, engage with us uh, either individually. Um, if there's a group of you that wants to talk at any point, then um, we would really welcome the opportunity to uh, get this conversation going. And beyond that, um, we obviously are presenting research today. We're also seeking ways that we can support uh, humanitarian agencies and different responses from all different kind of clusters or sectors. So for example, we've been engaging around the technical working group for the shelter response in Turkey, looking into Northwest Syria starting soon. Um, and generally Kindling as an organization is here for um, supporting practice as well as, as research. So um, just wanted to have a quick shameless plug to say we're here to support you meet fire safety goals. Um, back over to you, Juan, and of course, happy to answer any questions, but I assume we are out of time. So. <laughs> Very out of time. Yes. <laughs> No, I think it's perfect. Thank you so much, both of you. And and Helen, if you're going to be in town during our global um, CCCM meeting, um, perhaps we can also have a chat on the side as well, whether we can continue this discussion that we started with both Kidling and, and Paul from MOAS as well around like, you know, how we can also as CCCM actors and the CCCM cluster um, also approach the question around fire safety and prevention. Thank you so much for your time today. And, you know, welcome to the CCCM family, Helen. Um, and we look forward to, to also seeing you and, and continue, you know, this discussion and look at how we can un better answer that question that you posed to us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we Thank hope you. you've also enjoyed some of the other presentations today. Um, so I'm moving on to actually the last